Hello and welcome to Cheetah TV. My name is Brian Badger and I want to wish you all a very happy International Cheetah Day. Now, holistic conservation really does rely on collaborations throughout the 23 range countries of the cheetah. Now, one of those organizations is Actions for Cheetahs in Kenya. So why don't we go out to Kenya and speak to their founder and director, Mary Wickstra. So hello, Mary, and thanks very much for joining us today and finding the time. And I know how busy you are. So uh, please, for everybody else, please introduce yourself and your organization. My name is Mary Weikstra, and I am the founder and director of Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Um, I have been working here actually since 2001, where we began as a project under the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And in 2009, we registered our own organization um, and continue to work in affiliation with you at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So, so you're a prime example, the organization is a prime example of the collaborations that go on throughout the Cheetah range. So we, when you um, say that you, you, know, you started off, did... did did you just take the, the ideas of, of, of or, or the ethos of, of Cheetah Conservation Fund and just use it in Kenya? Well, that was kind of what I had hoped to do. Um, I, when I originally came here, we were going to come in for three years and, and assist with the Kenya Wildlife Service. And, and I had spent a year um, between two different visits to CCF. Um, you know, looking at how they ran their programs, learning about the cheetah research side of things, learning about community involvement in conservation, um, human wildlife conflict mitigation. So, you know, I took a lot of the data collection forms that were being already used at, in Namibia, um, and then we began from there. But what we found is, is the cookie cutter approach doesn't work, even though we're both in Africa, the countries are so different in landscape, culture, um, the problems that are facing the cheetah were, were very different in some ways. Um, so we, we still used, you know, a little bit of the guidance of what, what I had gotten by working with CCF, um, but we also did a lot of consultation with other carnivore projects and other cheetah projects in Tanzania and Botswana and South Africa to try to come up with, with an approach that worked best here in Kenya. So it's almost like the conservation pantry, you know, there's lots of ingredients there, but you kind of have to cherry pick yeah. to, to make everything fit. So when you're working, yeah. you, met, you mentioned the, um, the Kenyan Wildlife Service. So, so again, that, that's more about the collaborations um, locally and, and, and obviously, when we're talking about locally, you know, we're, we're talking about huge areas and huge responsibilities of wildlife uh, throughout there. So how is your relationship with, with that? And has that relationship blossomed as you've gone on? Most definitely. Um, first of all, in order to do research in Kenya, um, your affiliations have to be with one of the government approved organizations. So the Kenya Wildlife Service is actually where like my first connection in Kenya on the ground came. Um, and, and it was through my collaboration or th through basically my affiliation with the Kenya Wildlife Service um, that we were able to initiate any of the work. Um, so I've continued to work very closely with KWS. Um, that's the abbreviation for Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, and every year I renew that affiliation. So. There are many different consultants within KWS that provide expertise, um, as well as, as people that we work with that we learn things together. So it, it's a very close collaboration, just like the Namibian, um, the Namibian, I can't remember what the Namibian the, uh, environmental organization is actually called. Um, but so it's, it's very similar in that, in that we have good partnerships. And those partnerships also lead to partnerships with other conservation projects. 
not just with cheetahs, but with lions and zebras projects. Um, one thing that's really cool about something that the Kenya Wildlife Service does is every year they have a carnivore conference that sometimes, you know, you kind of lose touch even though you're doing collaborative work with people. Um, but when you're able to at least get together that once a year, it reminds you of, you know, how much of the work you do that complement each other. So I think I've loved working in Kenya because of those collaborative projects. Yeah, the, the organization in Namibia you was talking about is the Ministry of the Environment, um, Tourism and Forestry. Now they added the forestry bit on. So so yeah, I, yeah. I'm sure that they 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 work in similar ways, um, but again, because of the, the differential in landscape and wildlife and and, and different problems facing um, the wildlife, um, they're they're ad as adapted as you are as well. Now, I would imagine that, that um, like with CCF and, 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 and many other organizations, longevity is a, is, a, um, is a key factor as well, because I'm sure over the years, goodness knows how many people have gone over there thinking that it's a quick fix. Um, and have you found that, that, that with that long, longevity, I kind of want to use the word credibility, it almost gives you more credibility um, as the years go on and, and with the results. Would you agree with that? I, I definitely would. Um, you know, when I, when I first wanted to come to Kenya and, and do research on cheetahs, I expected that I was going to be here for a few years. I had a, I had a three year research permit um, and I thought I was gonna, you know, help establish a project. And then I thought that I would, you know, I would just leave. But a lot of what ended up happening is the more answers you find, the more questions you find as well. So I guess, you know, when it comes to environmental studies and most sciences, you never stop learning. Um, I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the people. I was already in love with the cheetah. So that wasn't a, that wasn't a problem. But, um, but yeah, so it, it definitely is, is something that the, as the project grows, as as we've established ourselves in this country as um, an, an authority on the, on the topic of, of cheetah and, and our programs help with other projects that have established human wildlife conflict mitigation programs. Um, we've done several community development projects, some beekeeping programs, some cattle dips in helping with, with the health of livestock. Um, working together with other organizations on linear development and um, sustainable road and, and railway infrastructure. Um, it, it definitely helps to not just come in and go away. Now we take students that are both local students that want, want to get degrees and most of them want to go into conservation for the long term. They don't necessarily all want to stay working for a small nonprofit organization. Some of them want to go into government and things like that, but these experiences that they get, there's nothing wrong with some of those short-term projects when they work in collaboration with long-term projects. Um, international students also come and do short-term projects with us, but I think what helps with the credibility within the community is that they know that we're not going away. We might have students that come and go, but the main project stays and continues to help people. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean every, everything that you say, I, I I I'd love to disagree with, but I don't disagree with anything. Um, but uh, <laughs> not that I want to disagree with you at all. But it's the whole holistic approach. That's what that's what kind of excites me, and that's that's really what what my background is. And it, and it's that holistic approach that that it, it sounds like that that you you adapt. You know, you're a key player within the within the conservation world. Um, in in that part of the world, but but the the the, the holistic approach it, it's not all about the cheetah, and it can never be about all about the cheetah, and it can never be all about any one thing. It, it's that collaborative holistic approach that I think that 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 sees the um, that sees the the the, the results. So when you when you're um, working um, out in the field, um, are you working? with with the, the 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 farming community like the, that that type of community as well as like the national parks and the and the kenya wildlife service yeah so we have
have, we have project bases in two locations here in Kenya, and they're kind of almost on opposite parts of the country. So our Salama field site base um, works with some commercial ranches and with subsistence farmers um, in land that has recently been subdivided and basically people there are trying to more or less they, they can eke out a living with small scale ranching. Um, so it, it basically sustains them, but it's not commercial, if you know, for commercial sales. Yeah. And then in our northern area, we work with one of the national reserves, um, actually two of the national reserves with, with Buffalo Springs and Samburu National Reserve, which is tourism um, predominantly and, and very, very limited grazing in a reserve. Um, and then a few hundred kilometers, actually a, one and a half, a hun, 150 kilometers away from the two parks that we work in is where our Samburu field site is. And that's in the pastoral communities in the Samburu community. And so those are kind of the, the four land uses in which cheetahs live in Kenya is commercial ranches, subsistence ranches, pastoral communities, and protected areas. And so by having the base in those two locations, our research that we do in both locations follows the same model and collects data consistently so that we can look at the whole of Kenya um, and, and how each of those elements either impacts or aids in the conservation of cheetahs and the, the ecosystem that they live in. Yeah, that, that's great. I think it's worth pointing out to, to everybody uh, uh, the, the importance of that, because if you if you just purely do your studies in a in a national park or, or, or reserve, it, it doesn't really give you anywhere near the whole story, does it? You know, you can't really build that that main picture. So, you know, tying that in is it's the important part of the of the research. But tying that into, like you you mentioned, the pastoral, um, the the commercial farmers, and everything else like that, then you you do get that bigger picture, and that's really um, what we need for the cheetah throughout its range it is getting as many different elements so we can build build a picture because of the fragmented um, populations. When you say you're, and I think, yes, okay. sorry, go on, carry on, please. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think that what's what's helped with the success of our work in Kenya, first of all, about eighty percent of cheetahs live outside of protected areas, um, but secondly, our team here in Kenya is also made up of all the diverse cultures of Kenya as well. So even though there are kind of two primary tribal um, areas that we work in, which is the the Kamba community and the Samburu community. Um, the staff that we have are also from all different areas of Kenya. The, the field staff that assist us in the field themselves come from those two areas, um, but the, the rest of the team that we have um, has an understanding of, of how that impacts or how our studies show what is needed on a range-wide scale for cheetah conservation. So the seminars that we do bring in, you know, what we've learned into the other areas around Kenya that we're also working with on the National Cheetah Survey. Um, and so developing materials that can be used by other communities um, and also helping other, um, other community conservation units to establish data collection that supports um, looking at the range-wide scale as well. You, you bring up an incredibly important point and, and with, with the different um, communities, the different, you know, the tribal groups, um, some countries will call them clans or peoples or whatever you want to call them. Because I think, you, uh, and, and, uh, and I would imagine it's the same in Kenya as it is throughout most of Africa. You know, you've got different um, belief systems, you've got different tradi traditional beliefs, uh, and you kind of have to incorporate that to to um, to really be accepted within the community, would you would you agree with that? Most definitely, and and you know I'm I'm an outsider. I'm I'm not an African. Um, I grew up in America, and so I can't just take my values or even what I think would work. And and I rely so heavily on my team 
to tell me, you know, Mary, that's not an idea that would be accepted here, or, you know, let's take that idea and let's adjust it for what we can do here. So I definitely would not have a project if it weren't for the diversity of the team that I have working with me too. Yeah, that's that, that's great, and and, it, and it's all part of the you know the, uh, the 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 makeup of the country as well. You said that you love Kenya. Well, Kenya is the people as well as the as the wildlife and the diversity there, and that always interests me about Africa. So when you're when you're uh, doing your research, I know that you're uh, you're you're doing a lot of um, genetic studies uh, as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the genetic study that, that, and how you go about that? Yeah, when we, when we first wanted to start doing genetics, um, first of all, it's been very difficult to catch cheetahs themselves to do any radio collaring or monitoring or, of the cheetahs. So we kind of abandoned the idea of putting on radio collars. Our populations are so low in density um, across such huge areas here. That, that putting on radio collars became not only very difficult, but it also became challenging in that, um, in that if anything were to go wrong in the process of putting on a radio collar, your impact on that population was huge. So we started looking at non-invasive ways to be able to do the research on the individual cheetahs. And cheetah fecal material is the best way to do that. I did not grow up as a child hoping to play poop for the rest of my life, um, but basically that's what it's kind of turned out to be. Um, we started using detection dogs that are trained to find the cheetah fecal samples for us um, because their noses are much better and they kind of like the smell, unlike us. Um, so the dogs are, are the ones that we use to find where those samples are. In some cases, they've led us to very unexpected locations where the cheetahs return to frequently. In other cases, it's just a random scat sample alongside of a road and we never find another one. And what we do with those scat samples, we look at the cheetah diet. We are working in collaboration with the Kenya Wildlife Service Forensic Lab and with the Cheetah Conservation Fund's Genetic Lab to look at the genetic relatedness our partnership in the Maasai Mara has enabled us to um, look at a, a pedigree that she has identified over more than 10 years and then collected samples from cheetahs that she actually saw defecating so she knows which cheetah it is. And then with the genetic programs that are being used, including mainly the one at, that, that is being used by CCF as well, we can take the known pedigree and compare it to what we come up with um, in the genetic testing. And then we can use that as our, our model for the rest of the population in Kenya where you might not see the cheetahs as often as, as Elena has been able to see them in the Mara. So that genetic work is extremely important for the range-wide conservation. Um, also looking at hormones, reproductive hormones and stress hormones as well as the parasites, so the overall health of the cheetah. And, and so, so the cheetah poop has become something that most animal scientists know um, is a very important way to study animals in a non-invasive way. Um, and the partnerships are so important for that. Um, in the, the laboratory at, at the Kenya Wildlife Service, um, the team there has, has been a wealth of expertise in, in cheetah DNA extractions. And then um, the, the forensic, or not the forensic, the, the DNA, the genetics lab at, at CCF um, has the expertise to do the sequencing that's needed for the, for the pedigree and the population genetics. Um, so I think it's a great collaboration between countries as well as um, those local collaborations that we have. That's an incredibly important database to have, um, I, I think, because you know when you're talking about things like the illegal wildlife trade, for instance, you know you can you can use that on a forensic level. You know when you're trying to identify the source of uh, of uh, 
uh, of cheetahs that are being taken out of the wild as well. So it, it, it's kind of got so many strings to that bow, and the, the importance of the of the genetic information, I think, is 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 absolutely priceless. Yeah, and and as you know, there's there's a huge problem um, in Somaliland, which is where the cub trade is being processed through. And definitely, you know, we've confiscated or the Kenya Wildlife Service has confiscated cubs that are heading in that direction, um, as well as the ones that are being confiscated in um, Somaliland itself. So again, the collaborations between the countries on looking where the source of that population is. So it's important that, you know, that there's, Addressing the middleman or or the person who's who's funding the trade, but also looking at where that trade is coming from, so that efforts can be concentrated um, in the source of that population as well. So that's what a lot of this genetics is being used for um, on a forensic level as well. And I think it enables us to be proactive as well, rather than reactive. Because if you if we if we just continue just to be reactive to the uh, um, to the illegal wildlife trade, then then I haven't got a good feeling about beating it, you know. But enabling yeah. it to be proactive, um, like with so many projects, I think that that's the key, and that that comes with all the data and all the research and as, uh, and all the information that you, you, you know you and your organisation, as well as all the other collaborators as well, pulling all this information. Enabling, enabling us to, to, to be as proactive as we possibly can. So let we, I know that, um, that people are probably sick and tired of, of talking about uh, the COVID situation after all this thing. Can you, can you and I know this is a difficult question and a very, very it'll probably be a very varied answer, but um, how has is, is, is the, the, the global pandemic uh, impacted um, the, the uh, ICK? Well, first of all, um, Kenya is a major tourist destination and very, very dependent on the tourist dollars as one of the main, um, the main income, source of income for a lot of people in Kenya. And so it has impacted us in that way that the funding coming into Kenya through tourism um, has dried up. Um, for the for our project itself, um, you know, we we generally have tried to operate on a budget that we kind of have funding available until the end of a year. Um, so we were okay in terms of not losing any employees, not having to lay anybody off um, during the time of the pandemic. But raising the funding for 2021 is a challenge um, because there is a lot of con competition for the conservation dollar. Um, immediately when the first cases came into Kenya, um, the Kenyan government locked the country down. So we had about two days to make a decision on where we wanted to each be in terms of our staff. So of course, most of the field staff, they already worked from home. Um, so we, we gave them some time off to be able to adjust to kids having to come home from school and other family members who have lost their jobs and being able to be there for their families during, during the first month of the lockdown. As the lockdown continued, um, we started to do partial work in the field um, with those field staff that stayed out in the field. And we found how essential the work that they do was in that there were some cases of not just cheetah conflict, but there were in our Samburu community, um, there was a case of a couple of people who had been killed by elephants and the community themselves, not knowing who to turn to, would normally have called the Conservancy, the Kenya Wildlife Service, as well as us. But with everybody not being very available during the lockdown, it was our team that were able to console the community and work with the community on trying to set up something that kept people safe from elephants that were just looking for water. Um, and, and it made us realize how important our job is in the community, that it isn't just only about cheetahs. Um, it also gave us an opportunity for some of our staff who have been behind, um, you're kind of looking at one of them, 
in, in analyzing data and writing the papers that we need to write so that our information can be shared. And it gave us a chance for a few months. We, a few of us decided that we were gonna be locked down in Nairobi together and we were gonna work on some of those papers. So hopefully you'll be seeing several of them, you know, getting into publication that we probably wouldn't have completed if we had been doing the amount of field work we had planned for that time period. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's always a small silver lining on, on every cloud that comes over us. Um, and then in terms of, you know, getting back to work, um, as with most of the world, the number of cases in Kenya is still increasing. Um, we are not in lockdown, but we are still being asked to be cautious and to limit our interactions with, with people and community events and, and very limited numbers of social gatherings. So we are looking at alternative ways of communicating with our communities. Um, and, and that has been challenging because network in the, in the rural communities is also difficult. So these Zoom meetings and, uh, and you know, sending people things via WhatsApp and emails and stuff like that is, has been um, a learning experience for a lot of the field team as well um, and, and for the community members we work with. So we've had to make a lot of adjustments. Um, but I think that I think we've shown that we are a project that isn't going to fall apart when some of these challenges come our way. I think you bring up a great point, and 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 you, you said about the silver lining, and and I'm, I totally agree. You know, we've we've all learned. I think the majority of people, especially in the conservation world, uh, have learned different skills or or a different way of doing things. And I think moving forward, you know, when when this when this pandemic is finally over, whenever that may be, I don't think we're going to abandon half of the stuff that we do now uh, that we've been forced to do through the adversity. I think so. So I, I totally agree with you with, with the silver lining. And, I, um, you know, we, we all wish it never happened and we wish that it goes away. But at the same time, you know, we, we can learn from it. We can build on it. And hopefully we can be more efficient as well and and that's yeah. that's the key a lot of our a lot of our field team members also used some of the some of the skills that they have learned over time in 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 community communication and involvement to us also assist the community with with food aid and and um going around carefully to people teaching them how to make hand washing units at their homesteads um, we call them manyata um, here in Kenya. So the manyata or the shamba that people live in, depending on which part of the country you're in, um, so that, that people could set up the right kind of hand washing stations and, and helping, you know, whenever we've been able to get any donations to bring masks around to community members, um, to the schools as the children are going back to school, um, you know, we've distributed over a thousand masks ourselves um to to the different communities that we work with um soaps and and helping to you know if we're contacted by anyone that says you know we'd, we'd like to provide some food aid our our staff are really quick to help find the most needy people in the community and help get food aid to them as well so they've they've really shined i'm really proud of of all of the staff that i have that that's that's great to hear because you know an organization like a country is 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 as much about the people as any, any, anything else and it's and it's the commitment and the drive that always amazes me um and and will never cease to amaze me of uh, of the dedication of of people like yourself and your team um out there actually doing it you know this isn't this isn't a, an ex a, a, you know an exercise to pass an exam or to get a shiny piece of paper this is you know, saving a saving a species, saving a saving a community, and, and in some ways saving a country as well. Because you know, there are some countries around the world that I think will will, will struggle to to rebuild uh, after this. But it, it sounds like you know, there's a lot of positivity that's there. Um, but that's not shying away from the difficulties that uh, that you know that that hasn't happened by accident. That that's only happened through hard work. Yeah, and I mean, it was really scary in the beginning to to sit down and say, what do we have to do? What do we want to do? 
and, and what needs to continue and what can we slow down on a little bit. And, you know, again, that, that silver lining, you know, sometimes you, you just get going so fast that you just go from one thing to another to another and you never stop and take the time to enjoy each other's company and to enjoy the company of your, your fellow um, colleagues in the field. Um, and I think that's another thing that we, we took that step back and said, you know, let's interact with people in different ways. We all learn to use Zoom. Um, and, and that is, has continued. We, we started out having weekly meetings with each other, you know, where we were all remote. And now when we're getting back together with each other, it's different people using Zoom and different people in the same room with each other. So that's been kind of an interesting, you know, team way of looking at things too. Um, we also did something with the team that we, we called our gratitude jar. And in the beginning, when, we, when it was really challenging to be positive, we all would put a daily gratitude into a, a jar or a, 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 a virtual jar. And once a week when we had our meetings, we would read those things we're grateful for to try to keep that kind of positivity in our team as well. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's difficult times, but you know, I, I've found as well that I've, I've spoken to a lot of people so much more during the pandemic than I ever did before. <laughs> and, and, and probably that, that won't stop, you know, that will, that will carry on. So, you know, that, uh, that's another yeah. um, triumph through adversity uh, uh, as well. Now, upcoming on the, we're, we're, we're celebrating International Cheetah Day. Um, and during these difficult times, it's, it's very difficult to celebrate anything uh, because there's so much work to do. But um, are you doing anything or are you, are, you, um, are you recognizing International Cheetah Day in Kenya? Yes, we are. Um, I think you know that normally we play an international football cup um for internet or a football cup for international cheetah day and we normally have been holding that in our um salama community um we have this nice organization here in kenya that makes um soccer balls or footballs uh, um that are have a cheetah face on on the ball and so we've been using those balls as an opportunity to hold a cheetah football cup every year and this year we're not going to be able to do that um but in addition to um the normal playing football what we also always do is hand out trees to the teams and to the people who who compete in small challenges during the international football tournament um and so we're going to do another small tree planting but we're just going to be delivering trees to some of the schools and the, the government offices and and we're going to be taking the trees there and asking them to plant them on that weekend um, and we have been doing a project in waste management where we have been involving youth in how they can reduce the amount of waste in their community but also to do town cleanups um, we can't organize that type of thing in in the covid situation now but we have done something we've called our Takataka taka challenge. And Takataka taka is a word for garbage in, in Swahili. And we've taken, I wish I had one here, but we've taken some two liter soda bottles and we're asking the people to stuff it full of plastic. Anything that should not be burned and should not be blowing around on the ground. And so, so the youth in this, what would have been the football tournament, are all filling those bottles right now with plastic from cleaning up around their compounds. And we are gonna get together with 10 students um, on the, the International Cheetah Day on the Friday and the Saturday. And we're going to be building a bench at the school where we normally play the football tournament out of what we're calling eco bricks. Um, so basically you, you take those, those bottles that have been stuffed with plastic and you use them for the bricks to make a bench. So the, the students met today actually and designed the, the look of the bench that they want and how many eco bricks they're gonna need to fill with plastic between now and the cheetah day. And we've challenged all of our team 
to fill as many bottles with the with the plastics that they can as well. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing is building an eco bench and planting trees this year. That's great. And again, it, it, it would have been very easy to say, oh, we can't play football. So, and, I, and I'm glad that it's real football you're talking about as well. It might <laughs> I grew up with real yes. the one that you use a ball and you use your feet. So uh, yeah, rather than the egg yes. chest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I we, so, we, so yeah, and go on, carry on, please. Go on. No, normally, normally I I go home once a year and and I and I travel around the states and do a fundraising trip. And those footballs are something that I bring back to America with me um, without having the opportunity to go home and do the fundraising. We do still have those footballs for sale on our Shopify website um, and people can buy those balls. And with every ball that gets sold, another ball gets donated to a school here in Kenya. Um, so, so please, um, in honor of international Cheetah Day, we would like to see how many footballs we can sell off of our website as well. I've seen them as well, and I'll show a picture of, of the balls, and they're really cool, actually. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're really good. So even if you, you don't play football, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a good keepsake, and, and knowing that, one, you're supporting the organisation, but secondly, you're supporting the, the, the local schools as well. You know, it, yeah. it puts... There's a, there's a little one for like little kids that that you know just for throwing around the house and things and then there's the the, the competition size one as well right so. right well, well we'll definitely put that up so uh so people can see what we're talking about because you know yeah they're they're they're, they're cool things so Mary, if if I had your uh, gratitude jar there, I'd put a huge thank you in there because I'm very grateful for for you finding the time um and we want to wish you and, and your team um one a very successful um international cheetah day but secondly every success and, and uh, in, in what you're doing and hopefully you'll stay safe you'll stay healthy and you'll you'll carry on your mission that that is is oh so important so mary thank you ever so much for joining us not a problem it's been my pleasure to talk to you it's been a long time since i've had a chance to chat with you too <laughs> thanks mary it was great catching up with mary again out in kenya and the great work that Action for Cheetah Kenya is doing out there. If you want any, any more information on cheetah conservation, then please visit our website at cheetah.org. And there's loads of information there and free downloads and uh, everything about the cheetah you could ever wish to know. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel uh, to be notified of some exciting new video projects coming up, especially for 2021. Thank you.